Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with something a little bit different. I'm sure you can tell from the title of today's video. Uh, we are going to be talking about my favorite vampires. Uh, and so I just wanted to do something fun in honor of Halloween. Uh, this Halloween season has been kind of unintentionally all about the vampires for me. Uh, so I just really wanted to make a video chatting about all of my favorite vampires in media. So for the most part, this has absolutely nothing to do with books. Uh, so mostly we're gonna be talking about visual media and I think technically, most specifically, we will be talking about television shows. So I love vampires. I think at this point, probably most of y'all know that uh, the vampire is my favorite mythical creature. Uh, and I just really truly love most vampires. Nine times out of 10, you just have to tell me something has a vampire in it and I'm likely going to enjoy it. But my criteria for a favorite vampire uh, is kind of specific. I don't like vampires that have been kind of scientifically created or lab created, uh, and they kind of, in a weird way, fill the same hole as um, a zombie. Uh, so things like The Strain, I think was like this, or uh, The Passage. Uh, I'm not gonna include here, though I enjoy them for what they are, I don't consider those true vampire stories. I think a vampire for me has to be old. And so I also don't have any vampires here on this list who were like turned in the story. Uh, so new vampires. I'm not interested in how you learn to be a vampire unless it's two or 300 years ago, at least. I am only interested if you are a classical, uh, kind of more gothic vampire, a romantic vampire figure. But I really think we should get into it because we're gonna be here for a while. Uh, so I fell in love with vampires very early. I think we should start at the beginning. This is gonna go really in no particular order and only my number one vampire is ranked. Uh, so everybody else is just a favorite. But to start at the beginning, to tell you where my love for the vampire came from, I don't think it happened in the same way that it likely did for other people. I think vampires weren't on a lot of people's radar until Twilight. Not me. Uh, I was in love with vampires from a very, very young age because of a sweet little film called The Little Vampire, which starred Jonathan Lipnicki. Now, Jonathan Lipnicki was not a vampire, okay? But there was a vampire family in it, and one of the kids that was a vampire, his name was Rudolph, I remember this like it was yesterday, I fell in love, he was the cutest thing ever to me. I had the biggest crush on him, and I credit him entirely with my love of vampires. I have not watched this in at least 15 years. I think it came out in 2000, uh, so I really can't speak to the quality of it anymore. I'm sure it doesn't hold up at all, but uh, it was really formative for me at a young age. But please tell me down below if you remember this film, if you watched this film when you were younger, because I feel like it has been forgotten by time. I think that's sad, but I think it's probably also just an indicator of its quality. Now I want to get into something else that was one of the formative moments for me with vampires. And it is a medium that I think vampires work extremely well in. Uh, this might seem kind of off the wall to you, but I wanna talk about vampires and music videos. So I could have talked about so many here. Most of my favorite music videos have to do with kind of a gothic uh, or even vampiric vibe, and they're really great to watch at this time of year. Uh, so I will link to these videos down below if you would like to see them. But these three have massive vampire elements in them. They're actually about vampires. And I remember this as being a formative part of my love of vampires, maybe even prior to reading Interview with the Vampire, which was a lightning bolt moment for me. Uh, so one of these is one of my favorites of all time. Uh, and so this is a little less 16 Candles, a little more Touch Me by Fall Out Boy. To let you get a little bit of a peek into my music listening life, Fall Out Boy is my favorite band. It was my favorite band in 2005. They are still my favorite band today. Uh, and the album that this is off of is from Under the Cork Tree, which is to me, Easily the greatest album of all time. There's not a bad song on it. I could probably sing it all to you right now. But the basis of this video is that they are vampire hunters. The band are vampire hunters. 
One member of the band, Pete Wentz, who is the most famous member, he's the bassist, uh, he is a vampire who wants to turn on the vampire that turned him. He really doesn't like what the vampires are up to. And this video is insane. It is so great, and it's filled with a lot of cameos from kind of the emo scene at the time. Everybody that was on Fall Out Boy's record label was in this video. There are a lot of 80s references here. The opening scene uh, is a couple in a car akin to Lost Boys from the 80s. Uh, and it's just really fun. The color grade is so weird and it's still eye-catching today. And the story was just incredible. I think music videos are such a great medium for storytelling because they force you to get it across in a short amount of time. And so the song is secondary to me to the story in this one, but it's still a great song. This is one of the best on the album to me. Everything leads up to this massive fight in the streets there at the very end of the music video. And this is easily the best part, and this was a formative moment for me, and I still remember the first time I saw this video uh, because I then watched it on a loop for hours and hours straight. But Brendan Urie, who was the front man for Panic at the Disco, played a vampire who uh, kind of hypnotized a woman and danced with a woman before biting her and killing her in this video, and what a moment that was iconic. I just really think this entire video is well done, and it left off on a cliffhanger and we still don't know what happened. Uh, so I will link to this down below. Uh, the next music video that I wanna talk about is a more recent one, but I'm obsessed with it. I don't know really who this kid is. His name's Lil Huddy. Uh, it's come to my attention that he actually made it big on TikTok, but his music was suggested to me on Spotify, and I really love his music because he does sound quite similar to Fall Out Boy, My Chemical Romance, uh, an early Panic at the Disco, which I still really love and I would say is probably, you know, my favorite type of music actually. And so I really love his vibe and I love his look, but he has a song that's called 21st Century Vampire. So this is actually a case where the song has to do with vampirism. This is another one rife with 80s references, and it goes for that 80s goth aesthetic in such an interesting way. Everyone is made up incredibly. Chase Hudson is the cutest thing you will ever see, and he's so great as a vampire. His look really lends itself not only to the vampire element, but also to the kind of 80s gothic element, wearing that leather jacket, teasing up his hair, wearing the jewelry. It's just really great. And everyone in the background is also made up incredibly. Uh, so I think there are elements of Lost Boys in this music video, of course, but there are also pretty big elements of Fright Night, which is one of my favorite vampire films that came out in the 80s. I just love this. I love this music video and I love things like this that are paying homage uh, to older works and doing it in a really interesting and fresh way. I think this one did. I think I'm apparently the odd man out and really liking Chase Hudson or Lil Huddy's music. I don't have TikTok, so I can't claim to know him anywhere else, but I really enjoy his music. Uh, so I really like this music video. Again, I will link to it down below. It is such an aesthetic. The last music video I want to talk about is truly my favorite music video of all time, and it is one that I would suggest that you watch this Halloween weekend because the vibes are immaculate, uh, and that is Backstreet's Back by the Backstreet Boys. You all know what I'm talking about, and you've all probably seen this music video a hundred times if you've seen it once, but this is truly iconic. The setup for this music video is that the Backstreet Boys have to stay the night in this kind of creepy mansion, which is actually where they filmed Casper, just as a little trivia tidbit for you. And they all dream that they become one of the classic monsters, so kind of one of the classic film lineup monsters. And Howie D, who is one of the least famous of the Backstreet Boys, he is Dracula. And what a look, what a vibe, incredible immaculate. I mean, he just looks great in this. Truly, he does. And truly, this is just a fabulous music video. So Howie D is Dracula. Um, AJ is the Phantom of the Opera. Nick, who was my favorite when I was growing up, uh, is the Mummy. Kevin is Jekyll and Hyde, which I think is also incredible. And we really should take a moment just to 
talk about his makeup in this music video and how incredible he looked. Everyone looked great. Um, Brian was the Wolfman, if I forgot him. And the makeup was just incredible. It's so much fun to watch. And this is easily one of the greatest songs. This is the best song the Backstreet Boys had, I think. And I think we can all agree on it. Everyone loves this song, whether you liked the Backstreet Boys or not. Everything about this music video is just over the top and well done. The set pieces are incredible. I love the mice, the rats running around everywhere. There's a part where some of them are singing and a rat is like on their shoulder. They really went for this and I respect it. If you haven't seen it in a long time, it will be linked down below. Uh, what an incredible music video and it really sets the mood for Halloween. Before we move into more general media, I tried to formulate a timeline in my mind of when I stumbled across some of this stuff. Uh, and so definitely a little less 16 Candles was around 2005, 2006. That's also around the time that I first read Interview with the Vampire. And it's also around the time that I read a series by Nora Roberts, the name of which completely escapes me. And I thought I had saved these books. If I did, they're nowhere to be found easily, but this series was set up in such an interesting way. It had to do with witches, it had to do with vampires. I think there was also kind of a fantasy world element to it. I'll insert a picture here and I'll write the title down below if I can find it. But I was obsessed with this trilogy and I read it multiple times. And easily one of the greatest scenes I have ever read in any vampire media, truly it is. Uh, in the first book, I believe, the vampires come up to the house uh, on a cloudy day so they can actually come out because the sun is not out. Uh, and so the girl says, I'm not gonna invite you in. Of course, they have no power unless they're invited into your house. And when she turns, a little bit of her hair goes out of the door frame and the vampire grabs it and pulls her out of the house. Easily the most insane scene I've ever read in a vampire book. I just loved it so much. I would never have thought of that. It was so creative. Again, I can't speak to the quality of this series. This was 15 years ago. Uh, and I was really just kind of getting into adult literature at the time. Uh, so I can't really speak to the quality here, but they were so much fun when I originally read them. I think 2006 is also the year that Twilight came out and I, like everyone, had a Twilight phase. I think most of us want to deny it now. But we all had one. If you were a millennial, you had a twilight phase. Either you were obsessed with it or you hated it. I was obsessed, but it was not the best vampire book that I read. And I knew that even at the time. I was already into vampires when Twilight came out. And I think it wasn't what I wanted because Edward was not really uh, as dark as I would have liked him to be. It was really, really unique to me at the time, and it still is in my opinion, that Edward is the person who's kind of more uh, stoic and he's kind of further away and he doesn't really want to progress the relationship, but Bella is the aggressor and she wants Edward and she makes that very clear. Uh, and then as their relationship progresses, she continues to be in my opinion, the more dominant party, which I thought was really unique at the time. It was really refreshing and it was great for me to see as a teen. Also 2006, this is confession time. Uh, I wrote my first novel and you might can guess based on the theme of this video, what was it about? Uh, it was about vampires. It was about a girl and it is so hard for me to describe this to you because so much was going on that was just strange. Uh, so it was about a girl who had always had a dream that she was at a masquerade ball uh, with a good looking guy who of course was a vampire. Uh, and when she became an adult, the guy showed up on her doorstep. And so she had to come to terms with the fact that she probably dreamed something that was going to come true. And of course, that was the climax of the book. And of course, our vampire hero was a lightweight Louie from Interview with the Vampire. Uh, and he had a best friend who was terrible, who was a lightweight kind of Lestat, maybe even like Damon Salator figure. Uh, and so it's just, it's, it's embarrassing. It really is. And I have kept it. But I finished it, that's something to say. Uh, I finished it, but I firmly believed at the time that it was gonna be published and I let everybody and their brother read it at school. Can you believe that? How mortifying is that? How mortifying is that? When I go to my high school reunion, there are gonna be people who remember that about me, I can assure you. Remember, this girl pushed her weird 
vampire book on us. We all have embarrassing things in our past. I have an embarrassing vampire novel in my past. I've been talking for 20 minutes already. We're not even into official films, television. Uh, so let's get into them. And you can assume if I don't talk about it here that I've not seen it because I guarantee you, I just love vampires. Uh, so a big one that's gonna be missing here is Buffy. I have never watched Buffy. I'm sure I would love it. I do feel as though I missed the boat a bit with it. So we've already talked Twilight. Let's talk Interview. I have an entire video about my reread of Interview, but I think we should talk about the film really quickly. I know I saw the film prior to reading the book. And so I don't think I ever would have picked up the book on my own had I not watched the film. Uh, so the film was from 1994, I think, starring Tom Cruise as Lestat uh, and Brad Pitt as Louis. And Brad Pitt's never done it for me. Uh, as Louis, he kind of does just because I love Louis. I love Louis so much. Louis for a long time was maybe not only my favorite vampire, but my favorite fictional character. I loved the casting here. I really think had I read the book first, I wouldn't have enjoyed this film. The film makes some interesting changes and it does something specifically interesting with the character of Armand, uh, where they cast Antonio Banderas to play him. And Armand was like a 17 year old boy vampire uh, in the books. When you see Antonio Banderas in the film, you forgive them that because he just looks so spectacular. Uh, I would never have thought that Antonio Banderas would fit the mold of a vampire so well, but gosh, it was incredible. Uh, I also think I would have doubted Tom Cruise and I think I would have doubted Brad Pitt. On the whole, it's a very well done film and it's a very well done adaptation and I think the casting is incredible. Uh, from it, my favorite vampire is of course Louis. Lestat doesn't even rate for me. A lot of times Lestat just gets on my nerves. Uh, I do love Armand and if we are gonna talk about the books at all, just for a moment, Armand's book, he gets a book later on in the series called The Vampire Armand, where he does get to tell his life story. It is so good. It's the second best book in the Vampire Chronicles series. So you should definitely read it if you're interested in Anne Rice. I think it is so lush and beautifully written. I still consider Louis in my top five vampires, but there are other vampires that I think I like a little bit more nowadays. Uh, so let's move on. You will definitely see the tropes and the molds that Lestat and Louis set up present themselves in other vampire media. So Louis hates himself. He hates being a vampire. He's brooding all the time. There's always a vampire like that. And then Lestat is very happy to be a vampire and is obsessed with it and loves the power and control he has. There's also often a vampire like that. I suppose we do kind of have to talk about Dracula. Uh, so my favorite Dracula, I really sat down and thought about this for a long time. My favorite Dracula, and I am not joking. I promise you this is not a joke. My favorite Dracula is Drac from Hotel Transylvania. Don't laugh at me. I love him. I love him so much. I love everyone in Hotel Transylvania. Hotel Transylvania scratches the same itch as the Backstreet's Back video because it combines a whole bunch of monsters together and makes them friends. And that's just a trope that I really love. I love uh, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, uh, the Van Helsing film, which we will get to. Uh, so I just really love Hotel Transylvania and unequivocally, I love Drac. Uh, I think he's so great. But if I'm being serious, my favorite Dracula is the one from Van Helsing, the 2004 film uh, with Hugh Jackman. Because the actor in this role, I mean, he just went there. He knew it was going to be campy, but he allowed it to be. And I think it was just really, really excellent. And when we're talking about an aesthetic and a film going for a certain kind of cinematography uh, and vibe, I think Van Helsing nails this, not only with Dracula, but with Dracula's brides. The brides in Van Helsing are absolutely incredible and they own this film. The scenes with the brides are easily the best scenes. And the best scene of the entire film comes at the very start uh, with the best bride who is named uh, Mariska. Uh, and so actually, fun fact, uh, Josie Marin plays Mariska. She is a famous model and she appears in the Backstreet's Back music video uh, as a victim of Howie D's Dracula. So everything is cyclical, everything comes back around, but her look, 
the costuming, the scene of her versus Van Helsing, iconic. I'm sorry, it's iconic and it's absolutely incredible. Let's finally get into True Blood. I love True Blood. True Blood went off the rails. Uh, so this was an HBO show that's very tongue-in-cheek, very campy. Uh, it's set in the South and it follows a character called Sookie, uh, who is a telepath, so she can read other people's minds. The world of True Blood is interesting because in it, vampires have come out into the public. The public is completely aware of their existence uh, because of True Blood, which is a synthetic blood that is now on the market that they can drink. So essentially, it's safe for vampires to make themselves known because they technically no longer have to be predators. They can get this drink at the store like all of us can uh, and sustain themselves that way. Sookie meets a vampire named Bill Compton, uh, and she can't read his mind. She can't read the minds of vampires, and that kind of leads them into developing a relationship. True Blood was based on a series of books by Charlene Harris uh, called The Sookie Stackhouse Mysteries, I believe, and I love the books so much so deeply. Uh, I also really can't speak to their quality because it's been a long time since I read one, but I devoured them when I was in high school and I reread them multiple times. They are far and away better than the show. They honestly are, but the show did something very interesting, I think, with characterization and it went in ways that the books did not and didn't care to. I think from True Blood, we have to talk about Bill. And we also have to talk about Eric. So Bill, if we're going to go with the original Anne Rice mold, Bill is our Louis figure. Uh, he's very quiet, stoic, uh, and he's not really interested in the vampire life. Eric is definitely our Lestat figure. He loves it. He owns a vampire nightclub called Fangtasia. I'm not making this up. If you've not seen this show, I mean, stop this video right now and go watch it. But the show does a really interesting thing with their characters where... Bill believes he's a good person, and as the show progresses, you learn that Bill is not a good person at all. He is a vampire, and he's definitely done vampiric things, but he is somebody who I think is kind of a bad person, but who genuinely fights to be good and genuinely believes that he is a good person, whereas Eric... Uh, kind of comes across as the bad guy early on, but you eventually learn he's a very good person. Uh, and so it's just interesting the juxtaposition of these characters and how their character journeys progressed through the show. True Blood is, of course, a very sexy show, uh, and it has a lot of relationship drama, a lot of sex. Uh, the show is also very campy and funny uh, because it's very tongue-in-cheek. It's really interested in making fun of some of the tropes that we're really familiar with with vampires. Eric is still one of my favorite vampires. I love Eric so much. Eric was a Viking in real life, so he's a Viking vampire, and you know that knee-jerk reaction, I just have to love him. No thoughts, head empty, uh, because I just really adore everything about Eric. In the books, Eric was miles and miles above Bill, but on the show... I'm gonna admit this. I'm into Bill, I'm really into Bill because Bill is so fascinating. Bill is so gothic and romantic. He's handsome, he's pale. He has kind of a gruffness about his appearance that's just really interesting. Uh, and he really, really loved her. In every scene, you could see that Bill was thinking about Sookie. And there were moments when he would just look at her and you saw that he just really saw her for what she is. Now, a lot of this is down to the fact that Stephen Moyer, the actor, and Anna Paquin, the actress for Sookie, uh, they're in a relationship in real life, and the chemistry between them truly burned through the screen for me. And I think that adds to Bill's attractiveness because you see that he really loves her. But I think Bill is one of the most interesting vampire characters that has ever been created. Specifically on the show, I think what Bill went through was fascinating. Even when the show really went off the rails, Bill's characterization was easily the most fascinating aspect of the show to me. I'm the odd man out here. A lot of people don't like Bill. I love him. I think he is so interesting in a visual sense. He's so handsome. Uh, his coloration, he really always looked like a vampire. Um, and he always wore Henleys. I just thought he was always fashionable. Uh, and he also put on this really thick Southern accent. Stephen Moyer, the actor, is British. 
Uh, and so he put on a really thick Southern accent that nobody has nowadays. And a lot of uh, my friends that I used to watch the show with when it came on, they hated it and they thought it was so over the top. I love his Southern accent so much. And I wish there were audiobooks uh, of Stephen Moyer reading as Bill Compton because I just love it. Uh, Bill is a character from the Civil War. And so it's kind of always seemed to me that he was trying to harken back to an older way of talking. Uh, so I just really love his accent. And he always used to call Sookie Sookie. I just loved it. I really love Bill. Uh, this whole entire video could have been about Bill. Bill is, I'm gonna say it, Bill's my second favorite vampire. I know that's controversial. I really love Eric. Eric is really soft. He has a hard shell, but he's soft on the inside. And there is a really great season of this show when his memory is erased by a witch and he is just the absolute cutest thing. I love uh, Alexander Skarsgård. He's so pretty, but uh, he really shines in this season where he's just really sweet and kind. Uh, and that really also makes you fall in love with Eric when you finally see that softer side. Uh, I like Bill better just because Bill was always upfront about kind of being a romantic. And I think Eric kept you at arm's length for a little while. One of the most iconic moments of vampire TV happened on this show uh, and it was with a character called Russell Edgington and you all know where I'm going if you've watched True Blood but Russell came on to television one time and killed a news anchor and went on a tirade about how vampires uh, were going to eat you after they eat your children and it's truly an iconic moment in vampire media. Last but not least, I promise you I'm wrapping up here, but we have to talk about the Vampire Diaries. This also could have been a video entirely about the Vampire Diaries. Uh, so the Vampire Diaries is originally set up as a love triangle between two brothers, Stefan uh, and Damon. Stefan is kind of our Louis figure. Damon is sort of our Lestat figure. They are both in love with a girl called Elena who reminds them of their first love, Catherine. Uh, so this show was also based on a series of books, whereas I would say the Sookie Stackhouse series outpaces the show in every way. Uh, the Vampire Diaries books are terrible. Just watch the show. Every change they made for television was a good one, um, except for the fact that the brothers in the books were from the Italian Renaissance, which was just incredible to me. Uh, in the show, they're from kind of Civil War era. Whereas True Blood goes for kind of the sexy side of vampirism, the Vampire Diaries shows off the romantic side and even actually the more horrific side uh, because there's a lot of really dark themes here. The Vampire Diaries also digs into the past and it really plays with the fact that these characters are old. It is genuinely incredible. I actually think The Vampire Diaries is my favorite um, vampire show or vampire media, period. I think it nails everything about vampires. For Stefan, I have written down on my notes, Bill, but better. I kind of am hurt by past Jenny writing that down because I really, I love Bill. Bill is definitely my second favorite vampire. Stefan is in my top five. I love Stefan and it's an interesting thing to compare Stefan and Bill because these shows were on at the same time. So you were often comparing what they did when they were on air because actually, weirdly enough, they often covered kind of the same topics during similar seasons. Bill, I think, was a bad person and always played at being good, and he believed he was a good person. Uh, Stefan is a good guy who has some issues. Let's clear that up. He does have a lot of issues, but he is a good guy that keeps punishing himself for the past, and I really love that. I think it's so compelling. To me, Stefan is the best of the kind of Louis trope of brooding, self-hating, because he really has done some absolutely terrible things in his past. He's something called a ripper, which means he basically takes your head off uh, when he bites you. And then he kind of tries to put people back together again afterwards, uh, which is really sad and really dark, really, really dark for a CW show that came on at 8 p.m. Stefan is always one or two steps away from becoming that again. And so that's always at the forefront of his mind, especially in his relationship with Elena. Stefan is another one, like Bill, that I truly believe loved her. 
Uh, I really believed, even in scenes when Elena was not present, that Stefan was thinking of her. And so there's just such a really beautiful romantic quality to Stefan. But there's also that to Damon. So Damon is his brother who is also in the love triangle with him, with Elena. Uh, and I am not really team Damon. I love Damon as a person because I think he's really funny. Uh, he's one of the best of the kind of Lestat mold to me because he's just really funny. He's also really dark early on. He's a very scary character. He's a scary vampire. But like Eric, he has a soft side that you need to get to. Uh, and I think he's one of the most romantic figures as well. He is very, very controlling in a way that I do think is unappealing, but he's a vampire. Uh, so we already have issues with him. You know what I'm saying? Stefan and Damon are easily two of the most handsome vampires on my list. I love their looks. Uh, Damon is so dark headed and so pale. He really fits with the vampire mold. Stefan has this beautiful skin. I mean, truly beautiful, shining skin. He has great hands. Uh, everything about Stefan really works well for me. And you can notice a trend. I do tend to go for the brooding, self-hating vampire. That's the figure that I find the most interesting in vampire media, and it's the figure that I'm most attracted to, uh, is somebody kind of racked with guilt. I think that's interesting for a vampire, and I think it's something that an immortal being would play with and would think about. Also from the Vampire Diaries, we have Enzo who came in later in the game. I think Enzo is another of the most handsome vampires on the list because Michael Malarkey, the actor, is just stunning to me. Look at his jawline. He's just a really handsome guy. And when talking about a favorite vampire, we do have to talk about the fact that they're handsome. I think that really goes into it here. Uh, so Enzo is a bit of a dark horse. He's not one of the main characters, but he's also a really kind of damaged person. And I can't really fit him into one of the molds, i.e. I don't really think he's either a Lestat figure or a Louis figure. He's somewhere between, which makes him a really fascinating character. What happened to him in this show is a disgrace because when he was first introduced, he was a really compelling character to try to figure out. And then I think eventually they just didn't know what to do with him. And so they wasted him entirely. And then finally, we thought he was going to get a great happy ending that didn't work out. Spoilers for the Vampire Diaries, but I'm still bitter. Another of my favorite vampires uh, is also from the Vampire Diaries, and it's Catherine. Uh, so I did say at the beginning, the love triangle between Damon, Stefan, and Elena, they kind of are attracted to Elena because she looks like their ex, Catherine, from back in the day. Well, in this show, there is such a thing as a doppelganger, and Catherine is played by the same actress as Elena. And so Catherine is a vampire who has lived a very long time. She is so callous and mean and selfish and out for herself. And she's so great. I think she's one of the best characters on The Vampire Diaries, which is a hard thing to say. The Vampire Diaries was filled with really incredible characters, vampires and not. But Catherine is, I think, the standout of the entire show. I think she outshines even Damon and Stefan because her presence is felt even in episodes when she is not there. You're constantly wondering, when will Catherine come back into this? She's definitely a vampire that loves it and embraces it. And I love it. I love that trope when it is done with a female vampire. And I think it's done very rarely. But let's move into the originals, which was a spinoff of The Vampire Diaries. And mainly I just wanted to talk about this show because there were characters on it that didn't appear on The Vampire Diaries. The originals themselves are the original vampires. So they're the first family of vampires. And they're also Viking oriented. They're kind of like a Viking family that came over to America in the 1000s. Don't question it. You know, don't question too much of what happens in the flashbacks on these shows. But it's just really, really great. They eventually became so popular that they got their own spinoff, which was set in New Orleans. And there are so many great characters on this show, but mainly, Let's talk about the originals themselves. So they are a family of five siblings. A couple of the siblings are really not interesting. Uh, their parents were also really interesting, but I don't think I have time to talk about them here. So uh, the main three are Elijah, Klaus, and Rebecca. So Rebecca's the baby sister. She's great. Uh, she kind of acts a little bit like Catherine, but she's far softer. She desperately wants to be loved. She's hungering for 
a really great relationship with somebody and it's really sad to see her. She is somebody who grieves the fact that she didn't have a normal human life. And so she really wants that. Uh, when we go back to kind of the blueprint of Interview with the Vampire, we have Louis who hates himself. We have Lestat who loves himself. And then we have Claudia uh, who was a child vampire robbed of living an adult life. She becomes kind of an adult mind in a child's body, uh, which is a really fascinating concept. And I think in many ways, Rebecca pays homage to Claudia uh, because she does feel very girlish. She feels as though she is somebody who was rushed into adulthood when she wasn't ready. So in a reverse way to Claudia, she really wants her childhood and a normal life back whereas Claudia really desperately wants to grow up and become an adult. When they're on the Vampire Diaries, Rebecca is really concerned about going to prom uh, and getting a prom dress, and it's just a really sweet characterization because there was the ability to make her very hard, uh, and she came across like that in the beginning, but as you got to know Rebecca and you knew what she wanted, you feel really, really sorry for her. Then we have Klaus who I hated at first. Uh, Klaus is basically the main character of the original show, and he is the main original. Uh, and he was a main character on The Vampire Diaries for years before they got this spinoff. And so Klaus is a hybrid. He's half werewolf, half vampire, uh, which kind of keeps me at arm's length from him because I don't like werewolves. But Klaus is truly mean. He comes in in The Vampire Diaries, of course, as a villain. And one of my favorite tropes ever is that eventually the team have to team up with him uh, to take down an even bigger villain. That's one of my favorite tropes ever. And it allowed us to really see Klaus through a different lens. But once you saw his softer side, he's another one that you really felt sorry for. I think you feel sorry for the original family in general. Uh, but Klaus is an artist. And so there's always this kind of undertone of art to the way that he talks, to the way that he wants to decorate his house. And one of my favorite scenes in this show, and let's just talk about this season of television for a minute. One of my favorite scenes in this show is when he unveils this mural he painted to one of his old loves beneath the bricks in their house there in New Orleans, and he just kind of takes down the wall, it seems like, or he reveals it, and you realize that Klaus has been like this forever, and it's just so great. I think the originals and the Vampire Diaries both nailed the fact that these people were old, that they had lived multiple, multiple lives. And a figure like Klaus in particular seemed very classy and seemed very interested in observing culture as the centuries went on, which I think makes Klaus very compelling and very interesting as a figure. This scene happened in season three which is one of my favorite seasons of television of all time. So the setup for season three is that somebody called the Beast is going to take down the original family. And it's somebody who they considered a friend, a foe, family. And so they honestly have to suspect every single person that they know who has possibly occupied any of those roles. Just a really interesting season of television that examined the age of vampires, it examined family, uh, it examined how these characters related to each other in different time periods, uh, and then it also analyzed vampirism in general. It was just a fascinating, fascinating and incredibly entertaining season of television. I know you think I'm forgetting somebody, but we're getting there. Uh, there is another character in the originals named Marcel, who is another of the most handsome vampires on this list. He's just so charming. And so he is a vampire that was turned by Klaus again in the 1800s. And he has essentially taken over the city of New Orleans in the time that the originals have not been around. So he's not really happy to see them come back. Uh, but he is somebody who has been very close with them and has also been kind of an antagonist for them at different points in the show. I think he's really interesting because he seems like a regular guy. Not once do you think of Marcel as a classical vampire. He seems very modern and fresh which is interesting. I wouldn't think that I would typically like that, but I like the fact that Marcel seems to have kept up with the times. Number one, this is not only my favorite vampire from this show, from these two shows, he is my favorite vampire of all time. Let's talk about Elijah. Elijah was the first original that we met on The Vampire Diaries. He had an iconic opening scene uh, and he is 
easily the best vampire that you will ever see. Elijah is always wearing a suit. He always looks incredibly perfect. He's very calm. You get the sense that he could just kill you with a swipe of his hand and he wouldn't sweat it. He's also someone who carries around a handkerchief so that when he kills you, he can wipe his hands clean. He's a classy guy like that. Uh, but Elijah is also so darkly romantic. I remember being fascinated by Elijah, but I wasn't totally into him until he had a flashback episode on The Vampire Diaries. This happened in season two. I remember it like it was yesterday. Elijah had a flashback scene and he was also in love with Catherine, as were the Salvatore brothers, as has been many, many men over the centuries. You're not really totally clear on it until a character asks him flat out, uh, you cared for her, didn't you? And he replies, it's a common mistake, I'm told. And that was it for me. I was completely swept off my feet, blown away by him. I mean, I just think Elijah is the best of both worlds. Elijah could kill you and absolutely you should be scared. But he's also really darkly romantic, very gothic. And he's a very beautiful vampire as well. I think he embodies a classical beauty. I think he embodies what we think Dracula might look like. He doesn't really fit in the modern day. He has one of the most interesting faces. I think some of the people that they choose to play vampires don't really fit. Like, let's be honest, Stefan doesn't seem old. His face doesn't seem old fashioned to me. Elijah's does. Elijah seems ageless. And you're never quite sure when the show is going on. You couldn't put your finger on his age as an actor because he's just so interesting in that way. And most of the vampires on The Vampire Diaries are very current. Uh, they talk in modern slang. Uh, they wear a lot of modern clothing. Uh, Marcel is a really great example of this, as is Damon. And they've kind of brought themselves up to date. Elijah is still old world. He's still old school. He talks in a very interesting way. He makes you feel as though he's old in a similar way to Bill. I think Bill does this in True Blood very well. I think you get the sense that both Bill and Elijah are not of this time. Elijah just strikes the perfect balance for me between frightening and also really charming, really dreamy, which is what I think a vampire should do. You should be attracted to a vampire, but it should also be a little bit dangerous to you. We should be kind of moths to a flame here. And I think Elijah does that perfectly. Elijah is the perfect vampire in my opinion. Uh, so definitely Elijah number one. I'm gonna say Bill Compton number two. And then I'm gonna say Catherine number three. Louis number four. Uh, and then who am I gonna put at number five? I feel like I'm missing somebody really important here. I feel like it's got to be Stefan. I just love Stefan so deeply. I feel like it's gotta be Stefan. And so definitely I see a trend here. I just really love kind of the brooding, self-hating vampire, which in a way Elijah kind of is, but he's also somebody who's kind of accepted it. I think he hated himself early on, but now he's accepted this is what I am and this is what I've got to do. I knew I would talk about this for a literal hour and we are at an hour and one minute. Uh, so hopefully I can edit this down. And uh, if you have sat through this, please get yourself a cookie. But I would love to know down below if you have a favorite vampire, if you have watched any of these shows, if you enjoy music videos about vampires. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Happy Halloween. Goodbye.